Tonight, a long hidden secret of Afghan society revealed. So this is normal uh, in Afghan society? Yes, it's a normal in Afghan society. Parents in Afghanistan going to extremes for the sake of their children. When you don't have son in Afghanistan, it's a, like a big missing in your life, like your family is not complete. And from the Gulf, where's the oil? This scientist says she's found it. Clearly there's a lot of oil on the bottom. I mean, finding four inches of sedimented oil at 2,300 meters water depth, that was the moment that my jaw just dropped and hit the floor. We'll bring you the news tonight on Dan Rather Reports. Good evening from New York. This news program has aired many reports from Afghanistan, but nothing like what you're about to see tonight. Afghanistan is an especially complicated place where the United States is heavily invested in money and blood. But this is a story that's not about the war, the military, or corruption in government. This is a story about the survival of children and their families in a country with ancient ways that we might find difficult to understand. We began by introducing you to a very accomplished Afghan woman. She wants to speak out about something that's been hidden for a long time. In an act of bravery and to make her point, she allowed us into a place where cameras almost never go in Afghanistan, into her home to see her family. Banafsha. Good morning. Did I guess? Well, the sir, what's going on? What's going on? Say, yeah. It's a regular morning in the home of a middle-class Kabul family that may look like many others. Ita, 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 ita. This is Azida Rafat. She is the breadwinner in a family of four children and an unemployed husband. So my first child, they're twins. Uh, they are 11 years old, and their name is Banafsha and Behishta, so both girls. Then I have an, my another daughter, which uh, she's almost nine years old, and uh, her name is Mehrangis. And uh, an other one is the, the youngest one, uh, it's uh, six years old, it's almost seven years old, and her name is Mahnoush. This is a six-year-old girl. Azita Rafat doesn't have any sons. That drove her to do something radical that's changed the life of her entire family. She has disguised her youngest daughter as an Afghan boy. She has decided to reveal her family secret regardless of the risk it may pose to her. Her story is one about the extraordinary links women will go to in Afghanistan to create a better life for their children, even if it means masquerading your daughter as a son. Azita Rafont is a member of Afghanistan's parliament. That has already made her a target. Here, many believe that women shouldn't even leave the house much less make any decisions. Working as a politician, special female politician, it, it's very dangerous and it's costing your life as well sometimes. She speaks six languages and has a bachelor's degree in economics. But she's not a wealthy woman and she cannot afford the protection most other parliamentarians have. Most of my colleagues, they have like a four or five gunmen. They are guided by bodyguards all the time. At age 32, she has been in Parliament for five years. She's one of only 68 women here. She represents her family's home province, Badgis, in Afghanistan's northwest. Half a million people live there. Most are without water or electricity, and most are without formal education, especially the women. My waters last time were the farmers, the illiterate peoples, the poor people, 
the grassroots people. So, and of course, the same time, Molos. I was the first lady which got the support of Mullahs in Batkis province because most of religion people, they're not supporting a uh, female candidate. To many voters, her politics are less important than how she conducts herself in a society not accustomed to women in power. Her every move is scrutinized, especially now that she's running for a second term. Is she too loud? Does she dress conservatively enough? Is she a good mother and wife? How many sons does she have? For the most part, women here are taught early on to keep their heads down and never to speak to men outside the family. Doing so can lead to severe punishment. Women are put on this earth, many Afghans believe, simply to bear children. Those are also the values of many of Azida Rafat's constituents, and almost every day she meets with them as they come traveling from her province. And she's always expected to invite them to her house, where she must offer them food and housing for the night. For example, this night I will receive six people, so I have to go earlier to home. Uh, and I have to, beside I'm their MP representative and listen for their problems, but I have to make a dinner for them and also I should, be, should do a good hospitality for them as well till they are leaving my home. When she's in her element, Azida Rafat looks like a woman of power. But despite all of her achievements, she knows she could still be viewed as a failure. The reason? To her own husband and to many of her constituents, her true value will always lie in how many sons she has delivered. Later in the afternoon, she juggles calls from constituents with cooking for her guests. When they arrive, her husband, Ezatula, greets them. Like most marriages here, he and Azida were brought together in Afghan tradition. She was forced to marry him when she was 20. He's also her first cousin. The children come home from school, donning new backpacks. No, this is boys' bags, and this is two boys' bags. Then Ezatullah Rafat proudly introduces his son. It used to be that when the family had only daughters, guests offered their condolences. Every day when I receiving the guests, all the time they are showing the integration that we are so uh, sorry about it, we are feeling sad, you are a very successful couple, and you have everything, your life is a nice life, you have value, you have high position in the society, but unfortunately you don't have son. It was all they could talk about, she says. And two years ago, when her husband began pressuring her to get pregnant, to try again for a son, she felt backed into a corner. Finally, she made a stunning suggestion to her husband, and then to her youngest daughter. Actually, I came with this idea. And it wasn't like a, only our decision, no. I ask her, because you know, Mehran since, since childhood, she never had like a habit like a girl. You know, she liked it to be more active. For example, I remember when she been like a four years old, she asked me, could you buy a car for me? I want to drive and I'll learn how to drive in the car and also take my sister with me and go outside. But um, when we just raised this issue that, okay, Mehran, today your father will go with, with you to the haircut shop we decided to make, to just uh, form you as a boy, and you be our boy after this, our son after this. Or you like to be, and she said, wow, it's mean after this, play outside, fight with the boys, and also to play football, play cricket, I like it, and let's go. They turn Manoush into Mehran. Now, they finally had a son. It was as simple as a haircut and a pair of trousers but it instantly transformed the lives of everyone in the family. And they are not the first parents here to make such an extreme decision. 
So this is normal, it's normal. Um, in Afghan society. Yes, it's a normal in Afghan society, and it's a, and also it's a very um, it's, it's too much cases like this. If you are going to the village, even those people which very conservative people, you can saw a lot of cases like this. I remember one of my neighbor, she had a, a girl boy, and uh, she was like a six years old. When the Taliban came, one year more they continued like this, but then after one year they changed her dress and she came back to the girl dress and she, they kept him in, her inside home. This phenomenon has largely escaped notice in the Western world until now. There's even a name for it, Bachaposh is what they say in Dari. That means dressed up as a boy. It has been going on for a long time in Afghanistan through many different wars and governments, but it's something that's almost never talked about outside the immediate family. Just in Kabul, we found several other families with daughters passing for sons. These families wouldn't speak on camera, but they all said it's a well-known practice in Afghanistan that cuts across social class, ethnicity, and level of education. But in a country where there is very little official data and where family life is strictly private, nobody knows how many girls live here disguised as boys. So what drives a family to do something that is virtually unthinkable for parents in most of the world? There are no easy answers, but a good place to start is to understand why having sons is so important here. When you don't have son in Afghanistan, so it's a, like a big missing in your life. Like, like, like you lost the most important point of your life, like your family is not complete. In Afghanistan, only a son can inherit land, make most decisions, and move around freely. Unlike a daughter, who must be kept indoors and protected until she becomes another man's property, a son is life insurance and social security to his parents when they grow old. And that's why families without sons are pitied here. A woman who can't bear a son has not fulfilled her purpose in life here. A derogatory way to describe an Afghan woman is she who has delivered daughters. With most Afghans having little or no formal schooling at all, it's even a common belief that the woman herself can determine the sex of the baby. In the eyes of many, that made Azita Rafat with four daughters, a failed wife, and a questionable politician. And like so many Afghan women, she has experienced firsthand what it feels like to be a disappointment after giving birth. When my mother understand that I have twins and both of them is girl, so she, she really was unhappy. She not congratulate me, uh, and she started to cry, and she started to, to, to blame me even that, okay, we have a, we have a daughter-in-law and she is so healthy, she is so fat and she has a, she has a nice body, but unfortunately, again, it's a, it's a girl. And we wait for the son, we accepted that she will give us a son, grandson, but again, she is a granddaughter. How should I go to the village? How should I face with the people? I'm feeling shame right now. And really but it's tired. not just about shame and, and disappointment. Dangerous. In a society where men have almost all the privileges, it makes everyday life harder and more limited if there are no sons in a family. And that may in turn explain why disguising a daughter as a son has become a way of coping here. So now I saw that some of the gossip is stopped. The people is happy that their MP, their representative is complete right now, have a son and have a daughter as well, like other ordinary people. The family is complete family. I'm going to my friend's house. 
Now the pressure from her constituents is off, but that may not even be the most important way this has affected the family. Suddenly, another member of the family has access to the outside world. If we dress him like a boy, so after this we can send him to buy something, or he can help us outside work, because otherwise the girl will grow up. After two years, we couldn't let them to go outside, buy something, doing shopping alone. So it will be much danger for them and difficult, because society will not accept these things. And at the same time, I saw that my daughters uh, have lots of freedom outside. He can, he can play. Now, thanks to Meron, all the Rafat girls get out of the apartment more. It would be seen as inappropriate for a family to let their daughters run around too much outside, and there's a high risk of kidnappings. But when they are escorted by a man, or even a little brother, Afghan girls see more daylight. And inside the home, Mehran receives privileges that her sisters do not. She gets to sit in on the conversations of conservative men who would not allow any girls to be present. For Mehran, because right now we change her to the boy, so but for him it's allowed. He coming, he's sitting, sometimes maybe sleeping there or uh, sitting be, be beside the father. Uh, it's playing with their father in front of them, so it's okay. And, and, and society respect this, my guests is respect this, and thinking that, yes, she, he's a boy, so you have to be set with the men and learn from men. Like many Afghan women, Azita Rafat says she used to be a victim of violence by her husband. It ended when she was elected to parliament. And she knows that the improved life she has created today for herself and her daughters can only continue if her husband is content. On this day, he has taken three of his children on a mulberry picnic with some friends. A man without sons is seen as weak here. But now, Ezatullah Rafat is pleased to show off a son by his side. Do you think of Meron as your son or your daughter? To yourself. In Afghanistan, a man can have up to four wives. Ezatullah Rafat has two so far. Azita is his second. He divides his time between the two families. His first wife and a daughter still live in the province. For Azita, the ever-present threat of yet another wife in the family, a third who could produce sons, is also off for now. So it's a good to, to be like this. We stop most of gossip. At the same time, we give freedom for one of our child to be more in the society, in touch with the society, and also help us and support us in the future. I see the reform. Now, coming up next, what life's been like for six-year-old Mehran? She's getting a very different experience growing up in Afghanistan. Azita Rafat says that with her youngest daughter's change of appearance came also a change in attitude. This is like every morning. Every morning I should supplicate to him to, to have a breakfast, Mirangis. After one week, she completely came to the, this new position. 
and even she changed the, 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 the walking style, the talking style, and the way which the boy like is sitting like a more powerful and like a more uh, aggressive than the girl. So she completely changed herself and put herself to the new position, which was like a surprise point for both of us, for me and her father. And does Maron think that she's a girl or a boy? Actually, when, right now when you ask that you're a boy or a girl, so she misbehaving with you and saying that I'm a girl, not girl, I'm a boy. The older girls have accepted that there's another man in the house now and that it's their little sister. But sometimes the sisters envy Mehran's newfound freedoms. Merengis even requested that she too be turned into a boy. At the beginning when we changed Mehran, uh, my middle daughter, Mehrangis, so she asked me that, is it will be not better if you change me as well because I got too much weight and also I'm not looking like a girl right now. Then we sat with um, uh, her father and we just talked with her and we told that this is not like a we wanted, this is like our wish to all of you turn to the boy. Mehran goes to a co-ed private school in Kabul. She first entered kindergarten here as a girl student, but in her second year, she arrived one day as a boy. Even the headmistress was taken aback, but says that she too has seen it before. My son says she, uh, he's a boy, all of time. When I was um, a student in the Rivalhi school, I have a classmate uh, look like Mehran and uh, he's in the um, uh, 12th class and he uh, drives the um, cars and the bicycle. Um, all right. But she was also, this was also a girl. Uh, this like Mehran, it's good. Mehran is more assertive these days, her teachers say. But if it's changed her stature among the other children, at least the teachers haven't noticed. Most of her classmates know her as a girl, but one who just looks a little different. Is this a secret? Who knows about this? Everybody. No, it's not secret. You couldn't keep it secret. My neighbors, my relative, all of them know that uh, she's a girl, not a boy. And does anybody have a negative opinion about this? Actually, till now, not. No. Yes, the, the only negative um, uh, which we faced, it was in the school. It was one of the, their uh, teacher in the school, teaching all the Quran. So he told for her, you are a girl, and you have to cover your hair when you are reading all the Quran. Then my daughter saw that I'm son. I'm not a girl to cover my all hair. Then I can buy a cap and put it in my hat. So like you doing, sir. So this was the very clever answer of <laughs> my daughter. And next day we bought a cap for her, like other Muslim is wearing. Still, to most of her visiting constituents and to outside observers, Mehran's real gender remains a secret. It's an Afghan version of don't ask, don't tell. Few will openly question whether someone's child is really a girl, but most know that looks can sometimes be deceiving. But they all know it won't last forever, and Miron's freedom and privileges will come to an end one day when she is no longer a girl but a young woman. Once she enters puberty, there's no more pretending. Then we will change it back. We will dress her like a girl. But you know, 10 years or 12 years is a long time for the child. Maybe it will be difficult for her because some of the freedom will be cut. But I will try to speak with her and slowly, slowly, step by step, when she reaching to that age, so she has to be mentally prepared for this. We will try this. Even though Mehran must become a woman in the future, her mother still hopes that having grown up a boy will do her good. I'm sure most of people like brave women more than those women which uh, they are not so strong. 
and I think she will have a double experience, experience of our one boy and experience of a girl. For observers, the unanswered questions may be overwhelming. Are these Afghan parents destroying their children's lives or opening a window of opportunity for them? We may never know the answers. But for Azira Rafat, it's not that complicated. When we challenged her, she revealed another secret that she has never spoken about before. If she has been cultivated as a boy with a very different body language, different attitude, don't you think it could be difficult for her when she becomes more limited? As Should a I woman? share something for you, honestly? For some years, I also been boy because I'm the first child of the family. My father needs to, somebody to help him. But not in that age, even later age, like a 10 to 12 years, I changed my dress to boy. She grew up here in this apartment complex in Kabul. When her father needed an older son to help with the family business, she was assigned the role of a son. For example, in the morning I've been in school with girl dress, uh, completely a girl, but in the afternoon, because my father uh, needed some person to help them uh, in the shop. We had a big shop at that time. Uh, so, but I dressed like a boy, and I had a, like a cap in my, my head. It was completely like a boy, and nobody recognized that I am not a, a boy, I'm a girl. The shop is still there. For those four years after school, she was on the other side. Do you think it was helpful for you to have the experience of a boy to get to where you are today? Yes, 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 sure. How? I think um, it's make me more uh, energetic, it's make me more strong. Beside this, so most of my voters is men. They vote for me. And I have to talk and communicate with them. So maybe because of this, I have more experience about the men abbot in, 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 Afro in, in the Afghanistan. <laughs> And that program, the but that Both Azida Rafat and her family have been directly attacked by militants in the past five years, just because she's a politician. And almost every day, she gets anonymous threats over the phone. But despite the risk of exposing her family, she says she feels it's important to speak out and reveal what families sometimes have to do to survive in a repressive environment ruled by ancient traditions. And my son bought a flower for me. It frustrates her, she says, that despite all the good advice on how to empower and help Afghan women and girls, very little is actually understood about their lives. I want to say for you, something in Afghanistan happening that really is not imaginable for you as a Western people. Afghanistan is very com um, complicated country. Still, she says she's conflicted about what's happening to Mehran. I know that it's very hard for you to believe why one mother doing these things for their youngest daughter. I know it's a difficult. I'm human, I'm mother, and I worked for long, long here for human rights. I'm not because of to fulfill my wishes as I'm doing this, no. I'm just doing this because of the best um, to support better my daughter. I'm doing this to, do, to show for the society that, that son and daughter is not matter. She's hoping that there will come a day when no mother will have to make the choice she has made. I have hope that after 10 years, the situation will change in Afghanistan and we have more free and democratic Afghanistan. And it doesn't matter for her to look like girl or like boy. As we found out, Azita Rafat's story is far from unique. While Afghans certainly acknowledge the phenomenon, families with direct experience are, for the most part, reluctant to speak openly about it, much less appear on camera. Our producer reporter, Jenny Norberg, spent weeks in Afghanistan and is here with us. Well, Jenny, you've reported from Afghanistan a number of times, as have I. I never heard about this in over a dozen trips to Afghanistan in over a 15, 20-year period. 
Didn't hear about it from any diplomats, didn't hear about it from any military people, didn't hear about it from any Afghan officials, didn't hear about it from Afghan friends that I knew fairly well. Had you any hint of this at all before you stumbled across it? No, none at all. It's, it's a question that you can't think of before you almost have the answer. And once you start asking, it turns out to be true. But no, never. I think, you know, if I may elaborate, that um, it very much has to do with a country that's been in war for such a long time. And I do get the sense that family life is very private. It's rare that you're invited into a family, and even more rare that people open up and, and speak about their lives. It's a place where you mind your own business. Well, now, what about Western relief agencies and NGOs? Were they aware of this? Did they know about it? Oh, I went to them first. I, I can't say, but the ones that I spoke to either didn't know what I was talking about or said that it did not exist. So uh, from then on, I just mostly spoke to Afghans, and it turned out that almost every Afghan that I asked had a story of a neighbor or a relative or a colleague or a former schoolmate who had at one point done this. Well, tell us about some of the other people you found. Well, there was one story, for instance, about a 10-year-old girl in a very poor neighborhood of Kabul. Her name is Mina. She's in a family of eight sisters, where she is essentially the family breadwinner, uh, working in a store during the day as a boy, again, with a short haircut and traditional Afghan clothing. And as there are only girls in the family, only sisters, this is what the family has decided to do for survival. And some of the others? There are children, but I also met a few others, among them Zara, who's 15. And that gets more interesting even because it's a teenager. And when she opened the door to her apartment, to her family's apartment, she was dressed in a suit. And I wasn't even quite sure whether this was a young man or a young woman. It turned out that she had grown up as a boy and had brothers in the family too, eventually, but just decided that she didn't want to go back because she does not like to be a girl in Afghanistan because she feels that they're badly treated and she preferred to stay as, you know, as disguised as, as a young man at this point. And her parents are conflicted about it, but they still allow her to do it. What am I to say, what will you say to those people who say, you know, this is just another case of a small group of people, very small in a great team of things development. What do you say to those who criticize you? Well, first of all, we don't know. We don't know how many little girls, how many young women, how many adult women live today as boys, young men, and adult men in Afghanistan. We just don't know that. So whereas we have what we can call anecdotal evidence of this, we don't know what the bigger picture is, but I would disagree also if you told me it wasn't a big deal, because this is a place where we have invested enormous amounts of money and manpower and expertise. You know, all the best experts are trying to figure this country out. And something that goes on just below the surface that has to do with how people live their everyday lives and you just have to ask yourself, what else are we missing? Well, bottom line, both as a reporter and as a woman, what's your takeaway on this? I think that as we first started out discussing this story, as absurd as it is to us, we must remember that this is an extremely different culture. and. It does make sense when you think about it, because throughout history, when people have not been able to be who they are, or when you've separated, you know, religions or, you know, men and women um, and ethnicities, stuff like this tends to happen. You will pass for someone else. You know, women, American women who enrolled as soldiers in the American Civil War as men, just because they weren't allowed otherwise. African Americans passing for white, even today gays passing for straight in the military. You will see it throughout history and in different parts of the world whenever you segregate society in a way that calls for creativity and survival. Tinny, thank you. Up next, if you think all the oil spilled in the Gulf of Mexico is gone, one marine scientist tells us, think again. Finding four inches of 
sedimented oil at 2,300 meters water depth. That was the moment that my jaw just dropped and hit the floor. That story is next. Now we move to the Gulf of Mexico, where we find that the news cycle may have moved on, but the pace of scientific research is racing ahead at a very rapid clip. There is a lot of good news. The wellhead now is closed. The ecological disaster of oil on beaches and wetlands largely hasn't happened, at least not yet. The government is saying that much of the oil has been consumed by the Gulf. But despite all the rosy talk, scientists are not ready to proclaim mission accomplished. One of those researchers has a lot to say about the oil left behind. Just because the water is blue doesn't mean everything is fine. Um, there's still a lot of oil in this water and it may be at low concentration but it can still be accumulated and transferred so we have to really continue the hard work of tracking the impacts of this event. And Samantha Joy is a marine scientist with the University of Georgia. But she's spending most of her time these days at sea on the research vessel Oceanus. That's a National Science Foundation funded expedition ship that is chock full of scientists who are crisscrossing the Gulf. Dr. Joy has become a leading voice for those searching the sea, looking for oil. On the day we were allowed on board, the ship was about 30 miles south of the mouth of the Mississippi River, about halfway to the site of the worst oil spill in American history. 4.9 million barrels of oil spewed into these waters, and even though you can't see it on the surface anymore, Samantha Joy does not believe the oil has disappeared. You know, this is an environmental disaster, it's a tragedy, but it could become an even bigger tragedy if we don't continue to track this oil, you know, the, the, the oil's not gone. It's just not floating around on the surface anymore. And it, it's, in the, it's on the seafloor, it's, it's in the water, it's dissolved or dispersed. It's there, and, and we, have to, we have to understand what happens to it. It may not be on the beaches, which is a really good thing. It may not be on the coral reefs of Florida, which is a really, really good thing, but it's still in the water and it's still having an effect. And, you know, Exxon Valdez, I, I don't think that people really understood or, or sort of had a, a, a full grasp of the impact of that spill on the system for five years or more. And, and it's still having an impact on the system. So to, to think that this is going to be miraculously fixed in four months, in my mind, that's wishful thinking. It's, it's, not, it's not what's really happening. Samantha Joy knows these waters, and especially what's far down below on the ocean floor. I don't think we're going to have time to get it in the airport. For the past six years, she's been studying the sediment around the site of what coincidentally became the Deepwater Horizon blowout. The well was officially capped on July 15th, but stopping the flow of oil didn't stop the questions, especially the most contentious question of all, where did the oil go? Joy and other marine scientists said in August that 80% of the oil remained in the Gulf. But the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, released another finding about the same time that seemed to say just the opposite. It was an announcement that received a lot of press attention and gave the public a sense of relief. The government agency said that as much as three quarters of the oil was essentially gone. Good afternoon. At the White House on August 4th, the director of NOAA, Jane Lubchenco was upbeat. The vast majority of the oil has either evaporated or been burned, skimmed, and recovered from the wellhead or dispersed. And much of the dispersed oil is in the process of relatively rapid degradation. But was it degraded or did the oil just sink? Spray on. Spray on. The dispersants may be one of the keys. Designed to break up the oil, they were pumped in underwater at the wellhead and tons of chemicals were dropped from airplanes all over the Gulf, wherever oil was spotted. And though oil usually floats on water, Joy believes something is forcing it to the bottom. 
you know, it remains a, a question of how did the oil get from the top to the bottom? Was it the dispersant? Was it biological activity? Was it some combination of both? Um, those are questions that we hope to, to answer in the next few months in the lab. For her experiments, Joy and her colleagues are using a device called a multicora. It can drop to the ocean floor. They sampled as deep as 6,900 feet on this trip. The device pulls up not only what's resting on the bottom, but also what's under the surface of the bottom. And what they're bringing to the surface is a lot more than mud. I mean, I've really never seen anything that looks quite like a sedimented oil layers. It's like grease. They're spectacular. You look at this and you're just like, wow. I mean, I knew there was going to be oil on the bottom. There had to be. It was impossible for there not to. It can't just vanish like a ghost. Um, but I didn't expect to see a layer like that of sedimented oil. But the oil is not just in the sediment. All that precious mud, huh? Joe Montoya is the lead researcher on the Oceanus. A marine biologist from Georgia Tech, he studies what he calls the features of the water, and he doesn't like what he sees. By feature, I mean portions of the water column where there's some opacity, where there's something that's blocking out some of the light in the water, where there's a reduction in oxygen concentration, and where we at least occasionally see fluorescent signatures that are associated with oil or oil-like compounds. We began seeing this really coherent set of features at multiple levels within the water column, not just at one station, but at a series of stations extending westward. We're, yeah, we're going to just turn it around. Beyond the oil mixed with the sediment and in the water, Montoya and his colleagues did not see something they've always seen before, an ocean teeming with small living organisms. The first big finding after we got back out here was to the northeast when we found a thick layer of sedimented oil on the seafloor. And in amongst that layer of sedimented oil were a lot of dead zooplankton and worms. It looks like the oil settled through the water column and just pulled things out with it. So the, the interesting finding isn't just the oil, but what's mixed in with the oil and the fact that we didn't see any invertebrates or any other normal organisms that you would see in the seafloor. In, in where we thought, saw the thick oil on the seafloor, there was basically microorganisms, and that was about it. Scientists have a name for it, anoxic, that is, water without oxygen, unable to sustain life. I don't think anyone ever thought the Gulf of Mexico was going to go anoxic. I certainly didn't. But I did think that you could get pockets of water that had reduced oxygen concentrations. And, and we're seeing not only pockets, but large lenses of water. And they're not dangerous to life but it's certainly a perturbation to the system and it's gonna take some time for the system to recover from that. And while the Gulf has been open to commercial fishing again, at the bottom of the sea, scientists like Samantha Joy are reporting some disturbing sightings. We found numerous dead worm tubes that didn't have worms in them. Um, one of the, the best indicators of just the sudden acute nature of the events is there are these plankton in the ocean, little um, organisms with aragonite shells that swim around in the water called pteropods. Pteropods are tiny organisms that are at the bottom of the food chain, but they're an essential nutrient for larger fish, and that food is now gone in some parts of the Gulf. The core samples are revealing an ocean floor littered with shells, but no pteropods. And it looks like a graveyard for pteropods in some places, so that tells you that these guys really got hit hard by the oil and and presumably I can't imagine why else they would just be suddenly falling to the seafloor uh, in mass um, but but those sorts of impacts are things that you know nobody has really uh, talked about or, or documented uh, thus far and, and those are important components of the system that if you knock out those components it, it will have impacts you know up the food web. Pteropods are zooplankton and when you think about microorganisms, phytoplankton, zooplankton, small fish, bigger fish. So it, it all kind of goes together. And, and when, when you knock out one level, you're impacting the next level, and then you're impacting the next. It, it's, a, it's a cascade. And you know, the, the, the point about the pteropods isn't really who eats them. It's the fact that if the pteropods are getting knocked out, that's a visible thing that you can see. 
Samantha Joy and her team are back on dry land now. The Oceanus just returned to port, loaded with sea samples that need further analysis. You know, we've all been scratching our heads trying to come up with alternative explanations, but you know, the most obvious thing is it, it's, it's surface oil that has sedimented to the bottom, and that's not far-fetched. Before she could leave the ship, she was already taking calls from scientists in Washington. The word was already out on what she found. I mean, clearly there's a lot of oil on the bottom. I mean, finding four inches of sedimented oil at 2,300 meters water depth, um, that, if I had to say, you know, what, was, what was your jaw-dropping moment during the cruise, that was, that was the moment that my jaw just dropped and hit the floor because I thought there would be nothing at 2,300 meters. Everybody's jaw dropped. And she says she's relayed the coordinates of her findings to government scientists so they can see it for themselves. The worst of the oil was about a mile straight down. The problem has been that, in my opinion, the, the, the federal officials want it to be perfect. They want to know that they're absolutely correct in what they're going to say. And therefore, they, they don't want to put information out there, perhaps, until they can emphatically say, this is what's happening and this is, this is the deal. As an academic scientist, you know you can never be certain about anything. Nobody can. Nothing's 100 percent. And we can't say how much oil is on the bottom. But we can certainly say that we sampled sites in May that didn't have any oil. And now, four months later, they have three to four inches of sedimented oil on the surface. That's a big difference. The sedimentation rate out here is not four inches a year. <laughs> You know, that's not normal. Think about taking just a sticky strip and dropping it through the water column. And anything the sticky strip comes in contact with is going to get stripped out and taken to the bottom. And it gets heavier and heavier and settles faster and faster. And that's essentially this, this you know, slime road that has taken stuff from the top down to the bottom. Dr. Samantha Joy. In response to growing confusion about the state of scientific research in the Gulf, the Obama administration has now announced what it calls a comprehensive review, incorporating the work of government and academic scientists. Reports may come soon, and we on this program will continue to investigate and follow developments in the Gulf in the weeks and months ahead. And now a couple of updates on some of our recent stories. This spring, as a way of calling attention to a national problem, we went to Portland, Oregon to investigate that city's growing difficulties with underage prostitution. One of the major ways these young girls have been exploited and sold was through sex ads on the internet site Craigslist. For years, child advocates had implored Craigslist to take down these lucrative ads, which reportedly brought the company $44 million in profit this year alone. Well, without warning, Craigslist blocked the sex ads in early September, and the site recently announced that it intends to make that action permanent. We've also been closely following for quite a while the issue of concussions in professional and youth sports, and there's news to report about head injuries and basketball. A national study has found an alarming spike in the number of traumatic brain injuries to young basketball players a 70% increase in the past decade. We profiled Nikki Popier, a New Jersey high school student who suffered 11 concussions playing high school basketball and was finally forced to quit the game. As you were developing as a basketball player, did you think about concussions, think about head injuries? Not at all. Like when I got hit in the head, like the first couple of times I was just like, like I have to suck it up, like I want to play, I don't want to sit out. but. Nobody even told me to sit out, so I was like, okay, then it's fine. There is now pending legislation in Congress that would set a federal standard for when players who suffered concussions could return to the game. Like you didn't miss a beat. And that's our program for tonight. From New York for HDNet, Dan Rather reporting. Good night.
If you would like to add your name to an email list for information on upcoming programs, or if you would just like to send a question or comment, please email us at viewer at hd.net. Thank you.